Thank you everyone, as there is a quorum present or declare this meeting of the committee open. I advise that the meeting will be streamed live to the City of Adelaide website and a recording will also be published to the internet. Please note that this means that uh, your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the City of Adelaide, including the transfer outside of Australia. The Council acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and we pay respect to their elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present. I have no apologies or leave of absence, and I think uh, we're actually all here. I'll move to three confirmation of the minutes. I'll take a mover and a seconder to move that there are two accurate record. Thank you, Councillor Sims, second and Councillor Ho. Any discussion members? If not, I'll put that to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Uh, that brings us to discussion forum items uh, 401, uh, an aquatic centre verbal update. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll pass to Ian and Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, members, just a quick update on the Adelaide Aquatic Centre update for myself and Tom. Just three key issues for us we want to talk through briefly this afternoon. Just the current ops, how the, how the uh, facility is operating, some funding requirements that we've been. Um, been seeking and chasing both state and federal and through local government um, opportunities and just a quick round back on the questionnaire today. On the ops side, um, we are budgeted to make a loss of $2.8 million on the centre this financial year. Um, on the more positive side, we've seen membership um, come back reasonably. We're about 10%, uh, about 11% down, sorry, on where we were this time last year. Uh, swim schools, which is a reasonably significant part of our revenue, um, we a little bit flatter for us. Um, we were at 1,772 swim school enrolments, we are down to 896, so it's about a 34% drop in swim schools. Um, and then patronage more generally is at about 40% where it was this time last year, but that's a really, to be honest, a bit of a rubbery number because it's still early days coming back from post-COVID. Um, so a little bit of grain of salt on that, on that last figure. Um, on the finance side, um, like I said, we've been following up with state government, Commonwealth government, um, capital city, community lord mayors, infrastructure Australia, a range of opportunities there where we're putting forward um, some funding requests off the back of um, the needs analysis. And, and there's a little bit of a range there in the types of funding that we're looking for, but we have to have our hat in the ring at the moment with a range of programs that are available. Um, there's obviously a lot of detail to be sorted out before we get to uh, some of the things that you would have talked about with Tom in your consultations, but we have to be at least present around some of those funding submissions. Um, so that's sort of the, the top line of where we're at, but I'll just hand over to Tom to give you a bit more detail on those three elements. Thanks. So members, as uh, the Ian has indicated, we opened on the 3rd of August. Um, it's been a, a slow opening, but we've actually had a targeted opening where we've actually staged operations based on COVID restrictions. So we invited our membership base to come back first in the first instance, and uh, so that we could test that uh, we were actually effectively uh, complying to COVID restrictions. We had our marshals in place and we could actually uh, service our members appropriately in regards to the activities. Um, as Ian indicates, uh, we are down in our membership, are down in our patronage. However, we do believe when we come into the warmer months and as we come into the school break, whatever, that will start to improve, as will swim school, because we believe our parents and uh, are holding off until uh, kids go back to school, and so we believe that our swim school will start to increase. Um, some of the things that we've uh, still restricted, and actually uh, we've kept the kiosk uh, closed, but it will reopen in time for the, the school break. Um, but uh, we won't, uh, we're targeting our retail probably slightly later, and that's with swim, uh, swim costumes and stuff like that. The spa still remains closed, but the steam room and the sauna is opened, and uh, we will be coming back with a further update in regards to members in regards to what we're doing with the spa. Um, it, it's one of those ones that it, it's very hard to control in regards to that warm environment and everyone's closely located. Um, Jim has done surprisingly well, and members are coming back as he is indicated. 
From a funding perspective, we've uh, tackled it from two, two aspects. We've written to the state government on two occasions um, seeking funding, and that funding is quite significant through their COVID-19 stimulus package, and we're awaiting confirmation in regards to where we're currently at in regards to the status of that. Um, we have based that and we have estimated that on the highest possible figure that we believe, noting that it may get uh, reshaped or whatever, so we have talked to patronages from a million to 1.3 million uh, from a patronage perspective, so and those dollars flow on from that, and we have provided them a level of detail in, in regards to that. From uh, Infrastructure Australia and looking through the federal government, uh, Unfortunately, from an asset renewal perspective, uh, we weren't included in that, but we've actually approached them again through social infrastructure, and uh, we've resubmitted that, and we've done some calculations to assist that proposal in regards to job numbers and all the associated things, which would actually assist that uh, uh, request. Um, we're also meeting with the American Sport to understand uh, what they're doing, and they've just released uh, a new uh, report which is uh, Game On Getting South Australia Moving. And clearly, within uh, Clause 8, it, it really talks to the Adelaide Aquatic Centre, it really talks to wanting aquatic facilities activation, this sort of uh, infrastructure linked to wellness, holistic, and all of that. So uh, we have met with them and we will pursue that. They are aware of the submission that's went in through to the Premier um, and we'll work through and see if we can resolve that one. Um, naturally, in regards to the elected members, thank you very much for those who attended on site or whatever. Uh, when we were going through various things, centre closure, you got the opportunity centre and the challenges that we have moving into the future. Uh, we've naturally presented a number of uh, uh, workshops in regards to the current condition, the financial position, and looking at the future. We've also uh, sent out individually to all elected members a confidential survey, just asking some key questions. Thank you to those elected members who have responded. It's really rich information, and we will be bringing that information back. We're aiming to come back in uh, probably mid to late October, uh, looking at a workshop, if not early uh, November, to actually start to talk about the key elements. Those key elements really are scale, services and location. Um, and then naturally that will talk to funding. Even though we've done early submissions on funding and we need to do it, that may change as we start to progress, but will give us an insight on how we can actually address it either within our own confines or go out to look at other uh, sources of funding. Um, and we will come back to council with that. If you haven't had the opportunity to complete the survey and you still wish to do so, I'm happy to to take it, whatever. Um, we did see it, I think it was the 28th of August, but like naturally you're all very busy people. But we're happy to hear that. Or if you wish to relay on your uh, thoughts during that, those workshops, happy to take that as well. But ultimately, where we wish to get to is to understand the future of the aquatic sector in regards to the certain location services are really important to us. And then naturally in regards to the scale, scalability of that center. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, but I can say we are progressing it rapidly with uh, both levels of government and uh, I think we've been uh, done our due diligence in regards to the information that they need to have before them to make an assessment. So just to be clear, report back to Council late October, early November. Yeah, through, through our workshop in the first instance. Uh, thank you, Tom. Given that was just an update, we'll just see if there were any questions relating to the content of it. Councillor Martin. Um, yeah, look, I did hear uh, Ian say that the loss anticipated for 2021, which we're only three months into, um, was $2.8 million, was that correct? How, how is that made up? I mean, it's a, a very large sum. It's more than our parking loss, I think, on-street parking loss, isn't it? Through your presiding member, it's made up of various areas. It's made up in the reduction of our two significant areas, which are swim school and uh, membership. But naturally, we're, we were anticipating that uh, we would have a later start in regards to the quad centre coming back into the quad centre. I can say uh, we are slightly favourable at the end of August, even though we opened slightly late in August and had a controlled opening. So it is our intention to beat that $2.8 million figure, concert, but this minute, well, I wouldn't say we're apprehensive, but we're waiting to see how restrictions impact on us, and we're waiting to see once warm weather comes in, will patronage come back? 
but it is our hope the way we're traveling at the minute that we'll be able to close those gaps. The big one for us is that 34% reduction in swim school. If we can make that back up, then all of a sudden that $2.8 million figure closes very quickly. Okay, and uh, what was... What? Sorry, can I just add mm -hmm. to the chair? Just want to clarify, so 2.8, it's, it's, it's an estimate for us at the start of the financial year. Lots of uncertainties in that for us, lots of uncertainties around COVID, what, what the health regulations will or won't be, no crystal ball on if there's a further outbreak, those sorts of issues. So we've been reasonably conservative, Councillor. And, and what were the operating costs in 2018-19, which was the last quarter year? Can you recall? Uh, we were looking at around about a million dollar loss. No, the operating costs. I haven't got that in front of me, Councillor, but I can certainly get that for you. But the, the net position was about a million dollars. Okay. And just to take you up on that point in relation to um, conversations with government now, without the benefit of having any kind of feeling from council about what kind of facility you want, how are you pitching how much money you want? Are you saying to them, look, we'd like uh, of the federal government to give us somewhere between 10 and $40 million, uh, or, or give us somewhere between 10 and 20, and we'll get another 10 and 20 from the state? I mean, what are we doing? How are we doing it? Through you, presiding member, I, I don't wish to divulge figures at the minute. The reason being is that not just confidential negotiation with the government and we're, we're in public. However, I can say that the figures are well north of those from both parties. So we're hedging our bets in regards to going in for full amounts from both parties, noting that there will be a negotiation point should they be accepting of that. So uh, based on previous conversations where estimates have been made on facilities of around a million to 1.3 million visitations, you've had associate figures uh, in regards to that. That's where we're pitching with both parties. Okay, and, and am I right in assuming then, and this is my last question, am I right in assuming that what you're looking for is a deal with either state or federal government in which the city of Adelaide contributes nothing to a new facility in terms of uh, infrastructure costs. Through you, presiding member, uh, no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we put submissions into both the state and federal government, subject to what they come back with and where council wishes to go in regards to a future recreational facility and the costs associated. That will either fully fund or there will be a gap, and that will be a conversation with the elected members in regards to their appetite to fund that gap. But I can say comfortably that we have come in at the very high end with both parties, hoping that uh, we can actually get <coughs> majority of the costs. That is subject to uh, final negotiation should they be accepting. Thank you. Any further questions, members? No. I just just a just a quick point. Um just on the swim school uh Tom, so that was a thirty four percent decline you said. Yeah. Um is that is that and I know it's school holidays, but is that also because because of the closure? I'm guessing. Did, did, did people find other swim schools? What sort of understanding do you have of that? Because it's quite lucrative for them. Yeah, look, through your perspective, remember, I, I could comfortably say I don't think that on the, on the whole 34% found other swim schools because there wasn't other swim schools open. Mm. Um, so we were, we were one of the first to, to be first off the mark. The issue is there is a distinct nervousness in families and whatever to, to reintroduce their children into an environment which is close knit in regards to swim school. Um, we've had to manage that in regards to social distancing, but as restrictions, hopefully as restrictions start to lighten and the warm weather, I think what you'll find is that typically our warm weather is when a lot of our swim school patronage increases. So uh, it, it will be subject to uh, COVID restrictions, warm weather, and hopefully that the, the, the uh, parents are less fearful in regards to bringing their children to facilities. Okay, and and um, bearing in mind, bearing in mind that obviously closing because we have to um, has affected patronage, which also affects the economic viability. Um, would it be fair to say that um, uh, the construction of a facility? Uh, in a, in a separate location while keeping the current one running um, is being factored into your consideration as far as, like if you close for two years, lose patronage, that affects the economic viability of your new facility. Will that factor into your thinking? 
It, it, it certainly does. Look, for, first of all, the, the, there's a conversation that needs to be had with the. Uh, we haven't decided to do that. This is not appropriate. If you are factoring that in, you know, you. Can, Councillor Moran, I've asked a question. Yes, can, if you wish to, if you wish to ask a question, so if you can put your hand up, you know the order. Commenting on the. Yeah, you're just commenting. No, but it's Tom's turn to comment. So the, the response. So to you can just can hold your horses, Councillor Moran. Hold your horses. So, um, if you have something to say, Councillor, we'll get to you. Okay, but Tom has the call. Councillor Moran, Tom has the call. I will not allow you to interrupt the good conduct of the meeting. Through you, Presiding uh, Member, and to quickly satisfy Councillor Moran. First of all, any, de any decision that will be made will be Council's decision. Um, so, that, and that's really important. However, the considerations that we have made is uh, effectively: do, do you would you close the centre or do you keep the centre open while building another centre? That's for council to review and look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. Viability. But in a report, in a report, yeah. you'd you'd bring that to us. We will bring you all the details so you can consider that. Right. Okay. Excellent. Any further points, Councillor? Well, I'd just like to reiterate what Tom actually answered you. It is no until council decides that they will build a new facility while operating the old one, that will not be in any report until we decide. Because Tom's not the, and it's not fair to put that on him. So you're- Except reports you're, have you're advice on, on options, Councillor Moran. The answer is completely incorrect. He told you that anything in that direction would be a and that will not be coming up to you until you decide that it should, as it should be. Thanks, Councillor Moran. Ever, ever hard. insightful. Ever insightful. Were there any further questions? No. And I just remind members: if we are talking, we are also turning our mics on. If your mic is not on, I will not have the call. All right. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Ian. And thank you for all members who are very well behaved this evening. Uh, we'll now go on to four two, which is the presentation of the representation review overview. And um, are we, where are we? Where are we? Where are we sitting for these presentations? Have we had a change in seating arrangements? Or? Okay. Sorry, uh, Chair. Yes. Is this, uh, this wasn't circulated. Yeah, that's what I was asking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Thank you for following the rules. It wasn't on the agenda. It, uh, it is on the agenda, Councillor. I didn't. Okay, I'll pass over to Rudy. Thank you, um, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, first, may I introduce Daniel Dolotowski. Daniel is a member of the governance team and he's the project manager of the representation review. So the intention of uh, tonight's presentation is just to give you a very early uh, brief overview of what a representation review is, um, outlining the steps of it so you get a, a bit of an understanding of that process before then uh, proper reporting starts to come into uh, the chamber with a three workshop. Uh, or a formal reporting uh, as we go through the, the formal steps of the representation review process. Um, some of you may have been part of um, representations review in the past. For some of you, of course, it will be a new process. This is a legislative process and um, it's a very important process as well. It's pretty much the cornerstone of democracy. Um, representation review, what does that mean? It really is about um, looking whether the community is properly represented at the council, whether that's through ward or area, um, from a, a structure perspective, from a number of council members in the world perspective. Um, and um, that's to be um, in place uh, every two terms of council or uh, every time that the uh, electoral commissioner determines that there is a significant variation at play which warrants to undertake this process earlier. Um, we were due to undertake that this year through, uh, due to the COVID and the uh, pending local government reform. Uh, there was a bit of uncertainty around this process, but now with the electoral, electoral commissioner, we've cemented in uh, the starting uh, date of this, and that means it's starting in October 2020. So it's starting very soon, this representation review. With then, the, after the whole process is completed, we anticipate that the whole thing will be finalised by August next year. So it is quite a lengthy process with various legislative steps um, in between and various uh, touch points uh, with council. So I 
Yeah. Um, here we go on this slide. Um, obviously, there will be some elected member involvement. You will be receiving regular updates uh, as we go through this process. We will set up a, a, a members uh, portal page on this with uh, questions and answers for you. Of course, the governance team will be available to answer any questions you may have. Um, impartiality is, of course, very important because um, it's a significant legislative requirements requirement that the elected body is at arm's length from this. Uh, the legislation provides for a suitably qualified person to be appointed by council, so that is you. Uh, that appointment uh, will be made by you on the uh, next council meeting in October, where you will be appointing that uh, suitably qualified person to undertake the review and prepare an options paper. Um, but that uh, person needs to be impartial and the integrity of the process is very important there. At the end of this, uh, when do we know the representation review is over and successful? Uh, that is when the electoral commissioner will certify um, the final uh, outcome of that. So certification is basically the last step. So on the 6th of October, we'll come to you at committee with the report that's then going to council on the 13th of uh, October. Um, and uh, we are currently finalising the procurement process around the um, uh, search or appointment of a suitably qualified person to undertake that review, which you councillors will appoint. So you council will appoint that uh, uh, person who will undertake that um, independent and impartial review. Um, so timelines, uh, as I mentioned, 6th of October committee, 13th of October uh, to council. This is to kickstart the whole process. That's when you will be appointing the, uh, the consultant. Uh, the consultant will then be undertaking one-on-one -on -one meetings with the elected members. So all of you will choose to have uh, a conversation with uh, that person undertaking that task. Um, on the 17th of November, a strategic workshop will be undertaken with all of you where uh, some modelling will occur. Again, for you, uh, an opportunity to um, provide your views, option paper discussion, rationale for current structure and, and current uh, future um, um, <coughs> options that may be available. Um, and then um, uh, an option paper will then, it will then be finalised. All of that is uh, guided by legislation and development uh, sections of the Act quoted uh, on the slide there. Daniel, do you want to talk about the public consultation component? Um, so after Council um, uh, presented with the uh, draft representation review paper, um, Council will be required as per the Act to um, note the draft representation review paper and authorise the public consultation element. Um, so the first um, public consultation uh, will occur um, uh, in February 2021 and it's legislative that it's a six week process. Um, so during this time um, we'll be um, inviting the community to provide written submissions on the representation review paper. Um, and now that paper looks at both the disadvantages and the advantages of each option. So um, there'll be an opportunity um, for the public to be consulted. Once the consultant has taken on the views of that first public consultation, they'll alter the representation review paper to reflect the public consultation. Um, and uh, an overview report will be provided to council. Um, during this time, um, between March and April, when the overview report will be, will be presented, um, Council will be required to again note the report and then appoint uh, the authorised rather than second lot of public uh, consultation. Um, and that will formally ask uh, members of the community to come into the chamber um, and speak similar to a deputation style um, to the options paper. Um, and they will have an opportunity to um, to strategically I guess, uh, add their value from a public uh, perspective. Um, between, uh, sorry, I just noticed that I've, I've lagged on the slides. So um, July and August, um, we'll have uh, the finalised report in light of the second public consultation. 
Um, and again, council will meet um, to formally endorse the options paper and the preferred option within that paper. Um, hopefully, um, uh, at this point in time, um, EXA will be um, looking at our processes. Um, so they'll have a, a keen eye on how we're engaging in the public consultation element. Um, and they will ultimately have a say whether they certify the, um, the submission and certification of the representation review paper. So a lot of these, um, a lot of the representation review, it's obviously guided by legislation and the Local Government Act. So there's some key considerations under the Act um, and also a, a really good source of information is the Electoral Commission have provided a paper on um, representation reviews and local government uh, as a guidance um, and essentially cemented that there is there are some key considerations under the legislation that council needs to consider and that the representation review options paper author needs to name. Um, so a lot of this um, essentially the options paper must examine the advantages and disadvantages of various options that are available. So if council is constituted of more than 12 members, examine the question of whether the number of members should be reduced and if the area of the council is divided into wards, examine the question of whether the, the division of the area into wards should be abolished. Um, Section 12A indicates uh, a balance or a necessity to ensure that there's a balance between ensuring adequate and fair representation and avoiding over-representation. Um, so the number of electors represented by a council um, through this options paper uh, must not vary by more or less than 10%. So section 33 of the Local Government Act provides that representation structure uh, qualification um, and ex have provided their indication that there's uh, that we can't have a tolerance less or more than 10 percent. Thank you Daniel and on that um, the Electoral Commissioner then certifying um, will indeed uh, give due consideration to all these elements. Um, it is um, it has occurred with other councils where ex are as part of that um, exercise determined that the requirements of the Act were not met and therefore decided not to certify. Uh, it has also occurred uh, with another council that um, EXA determined that poor quality data was used uh, to build the options and therefore certification didn't occur. It has also um, happened that uh, it was observed by EXA that the elected members uh, had too strong interference in the process and therefore were not at arm's length and therefore the integrity of the process was, was uh, implicated. Um, uh, we exa determined that there was insufficient public confidence in that process and therefore a certification did not occur, um, integrity of the review being, being impacted. Um, when that happens, we go back to the beginning. So uh, hence why it's very important as I highlighted at the first slide that that impartiality and the legislative um, component of it is really uh, managed carefully. So I just cast councillors' minds to the above data on the slide. Um, so any alteration of the council of wards of a council must observe the principle that the number of electors represented by a councillor must not vary from the ward quota by more or less than 10%. Um, we can see I've added the equation here, the tolerance is the percentage difference between each ratio, uh, sorry, individual ward ratio and the quota. Um, so the above data, we can see from the above data that, um, that there will be minor amendments made to either the ward boundaries or the number of members. Um, as the review will not be certified with a variance over 10%. Um, so what, as you can see, the following uh, 2013 representation review data is there present. And at our last periodic election in October 2018, we've provided that data as well. Um, to maintain the integrity of this process, we'll provide the most up-to-date data once we formalise the representation review. This data here is just to cast elected members' minds to 
the, the gearing or what, what type of options are likely to occur or how the ward boundaries are likely to be adjusted. Um, so where to from here? On the 6th of October, um, we'll have committee and on the 13th of October, we'll have council to formally endorse the representation review process. Um, once we've formally begun, uh, the consultant or the preferred qualified consultant as identified by the procurement process that hasn't been completed just as yet, we'll be meeting with each and every one of you um, uh, to discuss the ward options and uh, to discuss any concerns. Um, during this process, uh, as Rudy's mentioned, we'll make sure that you're sufficiently provided with information. This is obviously a lengthy legislative process that we're undergoing, taking the better part of a year, um, and we want councillors to be uh, sufficiently um, provided with, with information. Um, so there'll be obviously the members portal and we'll provide a, an up-to-date uh, questions portal. So you'll be able to answer questions at any point in time and we'll be able to publish that on a ledger um, for councillors to view, uh, to maintain that transparency. Okay. Through the chair, just a couple of comments from me. I guess um, I've been in local government for 30 years. I know Council Moran's 25 years. No one else would have gone through a representation review, I don't think. Um, we would have probably gone through two or three, maybe four of the review processes. Um, and it is a, a really detailed process required by legislation. And I urge you to be aware of it and input into the process because it only comes around once every seven years. Um, and um, it can be somewhat challenging from my experience, depending on the options that are put forward and the circumstances that are demonstrated to you. Um, there's going to be significant consultation that the guys have just mentioned to you. And it's a really great opportunity to look at the electoral structure. And there are different, different structures that are put in often they're reversed at the next time around. So it's, it's quite, if you, if you plot them through the years, it, it's quite um, intriguing to see the changes that are put in place and how they are adjusted to. But the important thing is you do have oversight by EXA and um, that's a process that ensures accuracy and appropriateness through through the, the, the process. And we're talking about like a nine, nearly a, nearly a 12 month process really. So it's quite detailed and it'll be quite long. You'll have a lot of opportunity to input into it. So I ask, urge you to just um, be very mindful of it and, and be, be aware of some of the um, some of the aspects that do an impact on what the result will be. We'll keep you fully informed as we go through the process. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'll just open it up to, to questions, Greg. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, would I be right to think that with the, the, the scope or the terms of representation review is not about the eligibility to uh, exercise a voting franchise? Thanks, um, through you, Chair. Um, I recall an issue raised um, by the Deputy Lord Mayor uh, insofar that there is a um, potential, currently a potential shortfall uh, between reach uh, to vote, to enrol, that's presented to businesses uh, which are on uh, gross leases. Uh, that is to say their uh, payment of council rates is not direct. Um, that um, before I sort of I have a comment to make about that but can you comment on, on what the current situation is with a shortfall uh, in uh, identifying businesses who are presently um, not paying rates directly through the chair <clears throat> that would be a comment that potentially could you could bring up as part of the process however um, the scope of this legislative process is quite narrow, so it's not necessarily about the voting entitlements, it's more about how uh, members of the community are represented in the structure of council, as in ward, area, number of council laws. Yes. Um, but in saying so, um, it's certainly a comment you can bring up. Okay, I'll, I'll just, uh, through the chair, just make a, uh, a comment to you on that. Um, this review is going to um, have recourse to data. 
as we are already seeing from the beginning. So we are going to be informed by the data that's presented. Um, where there is a material shortfall uh, in the outreach to businesses uh, which are not paying their rates directly, uh, where there is a material shortfall, you've got an issue uh, of taxation without representation. Um, I'm, I'm concerned that this review uh, and the data presented for the decisions we will, the input we will provide uh, will not have had that taken into account. I think uh, that must be addressed, um, confidently addressed prior to the review undertaken so that we have the benefit of data that properly represents uh, the full spread of business uh, participation uh, who pay rates. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Chair. Can I suggest that's a matter for the consultant, um, given we've been instructed that uh, it's to be kept arm's length from, um, or elected members to be kept arm's length from the process in terms of political interference. Perhaps these matters could be better dealt with by the consultant rather than out of this forum. We'll take that as feedback, Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, look, as, as the CA said, some of us have been through quite a few. The really, um, it, it, it is very narrow. And it's not about things like that, and it's not about what you're saying, Greg. It really is, and the things, thing that really takes a lot of time is where you put your electoral boundaries. Now, you can see what we did in 2015. Um, started off putting North Adelaide into the city. I think North Adelaide ended in High, at Hindley Street while we tried to keep the equal numbers. Uh, then we sloughed off Cathedral close to the CBD, which of course they didn't like. So that, that, that is what's going on. I can see there that the numbers have gone skewed with again. Um, so what's really going to put your mind to it, where those boundaries are, where North Adelaide isn't North Adelaide, where the CBD is going. That, that's the really important thing. All these other waffy things about who's got votes and I want more people to vote for me at the next election. Just forget it. That's not what the guy will be doing. Uh, you'll also have to, so boundaries are very important, numbers of councillors and whether you want to retain the wards. In my experience, they are the three things that you should focus your mind on. This is not a ragtag of working out how we can become less democratic, more democratic. It's just a hardcore facts, numbers, boundaries. So that's what, so try to get your mind around working that one out because that is going to be looking at those numbers that is going to be very difficult to solve. We solved it by putting three in Central Ward which means Central Ward is slightly overrepresented compared to the others but I don't know what you're going to, I don't know what you're going to do with that. Mm, it's a tough to, one. You might have to get another ward. You might get rid of wards. Because South Ward is the least represented and maybe North Ward getting, is the most. Maybe get rid of, well, you, 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 I, I'm not suggesting that maybe you get rid of wards altogether. That's where Greg came on council and there were 12 area councillors. Yeah, I think that's what the city Mark was referring to. I'm not to. advocating that, but that is something, it's very scary <coughs> to look at it because the ratepayers don't like that. But actually, we got, when we had 12 councillors, we were very well represented. We had two from each, basically people acted as though they were still wars. Uh, and we were well represented in North Adelaide and um, perhaps over in North Adelaide. So, you know, you can, uh, it's not necessary that you lose your local representative by going there and it would solve this. So, in a way, I am kind of recommending it, don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> it is difficult, it is that, that's, that's what's going to take your, um, uh, time to work out where the boundaries are. Mm. I can't want, imagine if you want boundaries. I can't imagine North Adelaide and Hindley Street are communities of interest in the no. well, we actually had one where we uh, read, we got, um, and we should look at those old maps because that's the old maps because they were good. Where we actually worked out our areas of interest, say the southeast corner was aligned with North Adelaide. So we could act, we were actually promoting this for somebody was wards that weren't actually geographically um, in the uh, joint that we had the CBD much narrower. We had the market district. So anyway, that, 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 that's the that's the Joviocchi Peter. That is what this is about. That is not what it's about. Excellent. Uh, Councillor, Councillor Martin, you had your hand up briefly. Yeah, yeah, just a, a couple of quick questions. Uh, 
it, it will be the 2018 figures that are used for the purposes of the exercise? I don't think that's the case. <clears throat> Through the presiding member, no. So we'll have the most up-to-date data as soon as we formalise and, and appoint the qualified consultant and officially start the representation review paper. So it, it would reflect, you know, for example, with the demise of the uh, um, uh, overseas student population, interstate student population, it would reflect that crash in population and uh, voter eligibility, I would guess. Through the presiding member, it, my best, to, to the best of my knowledge, we'll have the best, uh, most available data at that time. And right. then, uh, there's a reason why we haven't provided it today. Yep. Okay, no, that's good. Um, and uh, just in respect of uh, council having a choice of who this person uh, to conduct the review will be, it comes to us on the 6th of October, which is a non-voting meeting, and after which uh, nothing can be changed. So I'm assuming there will be a list of names presented. Um, how many names does the administration have in mind? Um, this has gone through council's procurement process. Um, I'm not across uh, the current shortlist, but that report should have all the information in it for you as a council member to make up your mind and come up with a, an informed decision around whether you followed the recommendation of the administration or not. Uh, and so you're saying the, uh, the elected body can say, no, we don't want any of those. We would like, um, you know, whoever. Yep, that is a council decision. So, of course, we applied the existing uh, procurement policy as approved by council to source a suitable um, candidate because the Act provides that it needs to be a suitably qualified person. So, you can't just uh, ask any consultant to undertake this. There's a, only a limited number of people who have the relevant expertise in this field and, and have done those uh, before because it's, um, it's not common off the shelf skill set this one sure. um, and um, that procurement process will then inform a recommendation that comes to the committee first for interrogation discussion and then ultimately the week after that to council for decision. Um, and, and that will be uh, an open rather than a uh, closed decision, that is a secret decision or a confidential decision. I'll have to take that on notice because uh, that report, of course, hasn't been uh, written yet. Um, we need to uh, ensure that the uh, commercial confidence information around the rates of the uh, potential candidate uh, is not necessarily uh, disclosed. And then there is the personal affairs component of the uh, so, so as well. It, it's going to be all behind closed doors. Um, I'm not saying that. Um, I'm saying that we, the administration. Them. They have not written the report yet. Yes, so they cannot tell you whether it's in confidence or not. They've written the report. It, it is. No, it's not. It is. You're putting words in Rudy's mouth. I'd prefer it if you didn't. You have your answer. We'll know once the report's written. You speak very assertive tonight. So it's a long, it's a long agenda. We don't have time for faffing about, Councillor Donovan. Thanks, Chair. Um, what is the source of the data for the 2020 data that will be used? Uh, through the presiding member, I believe that we'll be getting that data from our accounts team um, and our financial analysis team. So uh, they'll be helping us to compile that data. So based on rates? Based on rates, that's correct, yes. Councillor Hope. Well, I just like, I mean, I don't know about like North War or South War, I mean, like, but in Central, I mean, I'll talk about two things. One, is about the, I mean, like say the business voters that like a lot of the business might have closed because of COVID. And uh, I, I mean, a lot of numbers might change, I mean, like in, in about six months time or 12 months time before we actually get the real data. Because a lot of business now have already closed their door, right? And they have not located, but they have closed their door. And the other thing is about those, about the residents who are not Australian citizens. What I'm talking about is those people who are unable to return to the country because of the border close, and, uh, and also they are not on. I mean, they are not on the state electoral roll. However, they are they are our ratepayers who are, I mean, actually eligible to vote for council elections. And a lot of people are already <coughs> not here, but their names are still registered in the supplementary <coughs> roll. All right, so 
just let the joy of attention that like it, it, that that must be something that you should do to ensure that the numbers are a bit more accurate. I understand that it will not be hundred percent accurate, but try to do something to ensure that the numbers are accurate. Thank you, Simon. Uh, members, any further points? Councillor No. No, I'm just thinking around that because obviously this is uh, uh, trying to ensure that everybody who is able to vote can. Um, is this something that, that uh, as it gets, as we come away from this time now, um, and before it gets to, uh, too close to where you know where decision points are being made, that it can be just brought to us and saying, you know, uh, this this is the the way the information is being uh, we're able to collect, or or a bit more about it, because I mean, uh, after we're running out of time, and it's a bit too late for us to discuss or have, have an idea. So at least to make sure that you know we are able to cover everybody that is eligible to vote um, in that. Through the presiding member, so we'll we'll endeavour to make sure that um, we provide the consultant. The administration provides the consultant with the most accurate data. Um, and so we're definitely taking your concerns on board right now, um, uh, and uh, we're we're hopeful that that data will represent um, real tangible options that council will be able to choose. Um, just just picking up on a couple of those points, actually. Um, the, the point was made that people will be will be on there on the roll, um, but may not be here. How how do you verify whether? Obviously, if you're an Australian citizen, you're on the electoral roll. So I assume you take what your finance people give you, and you take what Exeter give you, and you mash it together, and you say this is the roll. Um, but yeah, on that supplemental of supplemental, how do you how do you verify? That or not. And I assume businesses, like what Jesse raised, businesses are on that supplementary role as well because they're not paying rates. Is that correct? No, no, no. If you've got a lease in the city, regardless of whether you pay your rates, you would. Yes, thanks. Um, through the chair, I think these are all very relevant questions that once we've got the consultant on board, we can raise with the consultant because at the end of the day, the consultant will apply the methodology. And um, so these are. Uh, but but I think I, I, I think the point that's being made is that you take the snapshot, you take the data, and you take that into the review. And if your data is no good, sorry, Claire. Sorry. If the data is no good, once you've started the review, then you're sort of you're in a very difficult spot then, and you may have to chuck the whole thing in the bin. That's. That's the and and like you said, it's it's a legislative process. Well, you can't unpick that mess once you've started it. Sorry, point of order, uh, Chair. It is a very long meeting tonight. We've got a really long agenda, and I think that has not a, been asked. That is not a point of order. My question has not been answered. Rudy was about to press his mic, and I would like. To ask my well, surely all of these and that is the consultant. <laughs> Wasn't that funny? Please, Rudy. Uh, the, the, the question was the question was around the data, the snapshot that you take at the start of the process, the process itself, and the fact that if you, my understanding, if it's correct, is that if you don't have the right data going into it, and that will actually corrupt your outcome at the end, mm -hmm. and possibly lead to the EXA saying no, this is not good enough. And I think you referred to a specific example mm -hmm. where an LGA did a review yep. and they had to can it. So these are all valid through the chair. These are all valid um, considerations. Uh, what we'll do um, is, uh, upon uh, formalising the review and meeting with the consultant, we'll run through all these uh, the data quality essentially analysis, um, and we'll certify with the consultant the quality of data that they require to undertake the review, and make sure that elected members, are, you know, that their concerns are, um, are addressed. Um, clearly, there's some concern about what the, the level of quality of data there, mm -hmm. and we'll make we'll ensure that um, your uh, your worries are, are addressed. Understood. Thank you. And just just on that point as well, on a, on a slightly separate note. So, you effectively, haven't answered the question of if someone leaves, how do we verify they're here or not? I assume it's a self-reporting obligation on their part. I don't think these people are doing that. Um, uh, it's, it's my understanding separately that we're actually the only local government area in South Australia um, that has a, uh, a, a business role, a supplemental role that does not have to be refreshed each election cycle. Um, and I think that's a good thing because I think it enfranchises more people. 
Um, but anecdotally, I've understood from the campaign and from my own experience that there are people that have been on there where the business has not existed or operated um, probably since that since that was brought in. Um, is my understanding correct that we are the only local government area that keeps people on the roll? And if that is the case, have has the administration undertaken any serious and concerted efforts uh, to reach out to people who would be on that role, businesses or organisations that would be on that role, uh, to verify whether they are enrolled to vote or not, whether they're entitled to it and whether they still exist? Through the chair. So uh, previous in our previous supplementary election, there was a process where the rates team received a lot of um, return envelopes um, and the electoral, uh, the electoral Commission was following up on bridging the gap between who's actually in the city and who isn't. Um, so there was some work to do um, from our rates team and with the Electoral Commissioner, but it, uh, my understanding is that process is we work together with the Electoral Commission to ensure that our role's up to date. Okay, but, but again, I made the point that there are businesses on there that haven't operated for two cycles. So I'm just not, I, I just want to flag that concern now that I'm not sure mm -hmm. that that process is, is watertight. And again, uh, international students that may have been enrolled but did not come back and perhaps are not coming back. And all of these things factor into your, your ward structures. And if Councillor Moran says the biggest task we're going to have is how you structure the boundaries, I think that's very much what we're doing. But what, is, what does that actually look like? And again, it means we have X amount of councillors now based on X amount of electors. Uh, but if that's not accurate, how, how do we know how many councillors we need to have? Questions, questions for the consultant. I just, yeah, yeah questions, yeah, questions, questions, for the questions for the consultant, but I think they're questions that if, it's, if this process is corrupted in the beginning, then you know, that's an issue. It's, it's not even to suggest the process has been corrupted in any way. Yeah. This is actually if talking the, it down. If the data yeah. is, is corrupted, corrupted, that is the point I'm making. Because Are you saying we're going to corrupt the I'm not. I'm not. I'm not getting in a to and fro. That's not what we're saying. The administration have taken the points which were made by everyone across the table. Um, unless you've got any further comments to make, and if, unless members have any further questions. Alan? Yeah, just 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 a quick one. So, can we introduce a process where we where uh, uh, I guess before the data is finalised, that can be. Um, you know, brought to us to, to show us how you got there, just to make sure that um, that it is 100% right, and or I guess as as, as accurate as, as possible, so that uh, we, we well we've heard that people, uh, whether it be individuals or businesses, do fall through the cracks. Can we try and fill in those cracks through the chair? Yeah, absolutely. We'll we'll be endeavouring to to provide you with that data and an explanation of how we get to that data for sure. Okay, any further questions, comments? If not, thank you. We will go on to 4.3, uh, the workshop on the City Connector Bus Service Review Engagement. Mouthful. We welcome our AD of Infrastructure, Matt, and his colleague, Zoe. Zoe. All right, over to you. Uh, good evening, uh, members. Tonight we're here to talk about the City Connect Bus and the, in particular the community consultation in regard to that. To Zoe shortly, to, who is from URDS, who is our managed consultant uh, for the consultation review. Uh, by way of background and a bit of an update, um, as you'll be aware, the Free City uh, Connect Bus service commenced some time ago, but uh, actually undertook a expanded in 2014. Since 2014, there's been a number of few, a few tweaks to the service, but there's never been a full consultation review of the service and what it means for the city. Uh, Dipti looked in 2019 to uh, change the service or cease the service on the back of uh, additional services being provided in the city, looking at different bus services, the tram extension uh, network, as well as the urban uh, connections and what that actually did uh, to the service. So that review commenced uh, in 2019. 
the service to the council cost in excess of a million dollars to run. Uh, so in the meeting of July 2020, uh, council resolved uh, to work with DIPTI on the deed to either extend the deed uh, or what that deed uh, looked like going forward. Uh, and uh, it also looked to uh, review costs and the impacts and undertake a consultation approach. So hence that brings us to the workshop uh, tonight to bring you up to speed on that, that uh, process. Um, so what this does is it gives us the ability to step back and look at best practice for consultation. So instead of going out with a preconceived idea and a number of options, we're actually looking at what is the service and how it can be provided uh, and does it meet or service the needs of the community. Um, the timelines are tight, so on the 31st of December we need to have resolved the deed with DIPTI. Uh, so the engagement uh, on the back of tonight, we would look to be going out to the community around the 17th of September through uh, early October uh, and the, the approach will go through shortly. Uh, and then return to the chamber uh, in November. So out of the workshop tonight, um, we're looking to um, answer a couple of questions. Um, in effect, uh, what are the members' views in regard to the pro proposed approach uh, that was issued out in the pack uh, in regard to engagement? And uh, second question is what are the members' views uh, on the suggested line of questioning and any additional questions that may be um, thought of that we need to include in, into the pack. Mm -hmm. So I'll now hand over to Zoe to run through the process. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor and Councillors, for having me here to talk with you today. Um, so to start off with, talking about what the objectives of the engagement, so why are we engaging? So firstly, we want to understand from the city community what, what aspects of the city transport service are most important to them. And then we want to know why people use the service or don't they use the service? Because by also understanding why people aren't using the service, it helps you give, give you an understanding of what some potential changes could be to that service. We want to gain, um, gauge, gauge the level of satisfaction with the service and why is it valued by the community. We want to understand how the service could be improved and that's where we can ask questions such as, are there any, is there a key destination in the city that you wish this service could go to? Or is it that the times aren't right for you or the frequency isn't right for you with the service? Um, we'd like to also gauge the level of support for what some alternatives to a city transport service could be. So that could be asking questions about, um, you know, on-demand bus services, um, Uber vouchers, that kind of thing. Um, and to gauge the level of awareness that council funds this service and do, do they, what do they think the role is of local government in funding such a service? Um, Importantly, the process we've come up with is really about helping to manage stakeholder and community expectations with the engagement as well. And also, most importantly, it's about understanding what are the community priorities or expectations that can help inform your decision making moving forward um, with how that service may be delivered. So what we want to do with this is really gather a lot of early information that helps you come up with what a proposed option could be for the service moving forward. So it's about empowering you with the right information to understand what your expect, what the communities and stakeholders' expectations are on council for that service and where they are seeing some issues or what alternatives they'd like moving forward. And then that can really help you in the future um, craft what that future service might look like and, and potentially consult on that then. Yep. I'll just press the forward button. Yep. So to come up with the engagement approach, we undertook a stakeholder assessment to identify the key types of stakeholders that have an interest in the service. And by understanding who those stakeholder groups are, it enables us to design an engagement process that is targeted in a way to ensure that each of those groups can find out about the engagement. So the information that council's engaging reaches them, but also that the engagement activities we do 
uh, to tailor it in a way that enables each of those groups to participate and have a voice. So the key, the key stakeholder groups um, that the approach covers is obviously the current City Connector Bus Service users, um, City residents and businesses, City ratepayers, um, key institutions on the bus route. So these are broken down into categories such as cultural institutions like the Art Gallery, the Museum, um, health institutions such as Women and Children's Hospital, educational institutions such as the universities, but also places like North Adelaide Primary School, which is on the route. Um, and then also social services on the route. So obviously places like Hutt Street Centre, we know that the service is um, people that needed access to free transport, um, but also um, other prov service providers in that space that are like in Wimble Square, where we know there's a lot of services there, but also covering things such as aged care as well. So we know that there's helping hand in North Adelaide. So we'll, we will come up with a whole list of all stakeholders that will reach um, covering those different categories. Then obviously as well, it's general public. So making sure that we reach just all city users. So they could be um, visitors, businesses in the city, tourists, workers. So there's three main um, engagement approaches or activities that we're, we're proposing for this engagement. The first is a series of surveys. So we'll establish a survey on Council's Your Say page. Um, and then we'll, we've engaged McGregor Tan Research to do intercept surveys. So that's when um, a, a, pers a survey person goes out into the field and approaches people with an iPad and they're aiming to ensure that they target 50 current bus users. So they'll um, do surveys in the vicinity of the bus stops, but also at other locations in the city to ensure that you are capturing people that aren't currently using the service to find out their views. And then thirdly, oh sorry, back to the ratepayer survey. So McGregor Tan again will be doing phone and email research targeting ratepayers in particular and asking them questions as well. So we'll be doing 100 surveys in regards to that. So there'll be across those three surveys, it's we, we're following the same key lines of questioning and that's really important because it will enable us to compare between those different groups to understand what are the key issues and um, opportunities that each of those groups see. Then the second main way we're gathering feedback is through online workshops. Obviously with COVID-19, um, it's, it's not easy now to do face-to-face -face workshops. So we will work in, within Zoom. Um, we're doing, proposing two online community workshops and anyone in the community can attend those and register. Um, then we'll be doing one stakeholder workshop and that's where we'll be targeting all those key institutions and groups that I mentioned before. And it's really valuable with, those, with stakeholders like those to have a, um, the workshop enables a more nuanced discussion for them to talk about, I guess, how the service is valued or issues that are experienced in terms of their clients, customers or visitors to their, to their institutions. So finally, we'll promote the engagement by core flute signage that will be established on every city connector bus stop in the, <coughs> in the, in the city. Um, social media, council social media channels, there'll be direct promotion through Council's Your Say database, as well as the direct invitations um, to stakeholders. So following this meeting, we'll take on board um, feedback that we hear tonight, of course, but all things proceeding well, we'll send out the invitations for the stakeholder workshops, which are scheduled to um, take place on the first of which is scheduled to take place on the first of October at this stage. Um, the You'll Say web page survey and the core flip promotion and social media will all go live on 17th, which is this Thursday. And the intercept and ratepayer surveys will commence from the 17th. The consultation will be open for the three week reply period. And at the completion of the engagement, we'll produce an engagement summary report, which will explain the process we've undertaken and summarise the key themes of feedback arising through each of those different activities.
Thank you, Zoe. So uh, over to Chamber uh, for any uh, questions or feedback on the engagement process. Councillor Simmons and Councillor Martin. Thanks, Chair. Oh, where that came from, sorry. Um, I um, actually just wanted to say thank you to uh, administration for um, the approach that's being taken on uh, this consultation. I think some of the elements of this are quite exciting. Um, in particular, the having iPads going out and talking to people um, who are using um, the service. I know that that's been done a bit in um, other cities around the world, but I'm not aware of us necessarily doing that in a formal way as part of our consultation previously. So I think that's that's really good to actually engage with the service providers on the street and, and moving away from just the reliance on the um, your say website. Um, so yes, I'm very interested to see what um, what comes back as part of that um, consultation, and in particular, um, noting that there's going to be engagement with some of the key demographic groups. So I think it sounds really um, worthwhile. Councillor Martin. Yeah, look. Um, in order for this to be an honest, open consultation with ratepayers, we need to establish. Um, what is the state government's intention? The history of this is that the former Minister for Transport, the one who lost his portfolio, uh, wrote to Council in January and said... Sorry, I'm, Councillor, he, he withdrew from those duties. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought they were... Yes, you're absolutely right, he did resign. Um, there was a letter sent to Council in January saying the government's not prepared to continue funding it beyond the end of the financial year. There was no advice to Council about any of that until May. Did we agree with the Minister on whatever date that we would accept the State Government withdrawing its 50-50 funding from that service? No, 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 Councillor. I'll, I'll, I'll refresh your memory and I'll refresh it. No, no, I'm asking the CEO. No, no, I, I, I can answer that. No, no, the no, answer I don't is... you're putting words in the mouths of the administration. No, no, no. no, no like Councillor, you... Councillor, I remember this quite clearly because it came to the Chamber and the Chamber, by a majority vote, supported my motion, which used the word reject. So the Chamber rejected the State Government's uh, proposal, which the administration have dutifully followed with. Uh, following from that, it requested that we have a workshop, which is this workshop, and then go to consultation, uh, which we're doing uh, in two days. Which All right. Well, that's what the council passed. Uh, and look, I, that was a sensational answer. I didn't see this. Let's move on. Now, I would like to ask a, a question of the real CEO. Um, have we conveyed, or has the state government conveyed to us? any undertaking or any uh, uh, decision that they will not fund at 50-50 beyond December 31st. That's the key. Thanks, Matt. Uh, through the Chair, the current deed is in situ till the 31st of December, and we are currently in uh, discussions with Dipton in regard to a potential <coughs> extension uh, to that <coughs> uh, on the back of the consultation approach we're undertaking here. So, uh, but, but this is key to it because if there is no intention to continue funding at 50-50 then it has to be a lesser service and therefore it's quite disingenuous to go out to people and say well what would you like to see if you actually have just a fraction of what you had initially. That's the key question. That's that's what needs to be answered. Well I think, I think the implication here is that if there were in discussions with them the fact that we're in discussions with them is a positive sign. Well, they didn't. They, there are discussions at least. Yeah, but how can you have a conversation, an honest conversation about? That's that's a rhetorical question, Councillor. But no, if we no, can bring it back. Question, if we can, can, how can you have a conversation if you don't know what dollars you've got to provide what level of service? The reason this was requested, and I know because I'm the mover of this. You're a mover, all right. Yeah. The, the, reason this, the reason this was requested was because it, it will be the first bona fide review, review of this service in a holistic way, in a holistic way, in the life that it, for the life of it. That's, that's the point. And it's actually, it's actually to, to answer your question, it's a chicken and egg argument you're trying to say here. You're trying to say, well, why aren't they giving us the money 
when we actually haven't justified how the money and actually reviewed and looked at how the money is being used. That's the point. There is a reason that this service is the highest cost per trip, a public transport option of any capital city for a bus in Australia. And it's because of these questions which we're endeavouring to go to our community and answer, I would suggest, Councillor. Does the CEO agree with what you just said for him? Or? Through you, Chair. Look, I agree. I, oh. there, are two, there are two ways to go with this. One is that you don't consult until you have certainty. The other one is that you consult um, for when you do get certainty. So, well, look, let, let this me is the direction you, of Council. Let me ask the CEO another way. Are you hopeful that we will get 50 50 funding from the 31st of December? Through you, Chair. I believe that once the consultation has been completed, that will determine the need and the desired approach that we can then use to consult with the government. In my view, that's a very practical way to go about it. Um, I would believe that if we can present a good case, it's more likely of receiving favourable um, decision than if we didn't present a good case. So to me, it's a logical approach. Well, uh, uh, what contact have you had with the new Minister of Transport about this service? Either the Lord Mayor or the CEO? Yeah, through the chair, I haven't had contact myself. Um, I don't know if staff have. We've been working with the department um, at this time only, so. Well, um, thank you. All right. Um, look, uh, one other question. Um, could we have an understanding, uh, uh, because this uh, consultation begins the day after tomorrow, could we have an understanding of what the information looks like that's going to members of the public? Because clearly that's already composed. Um, is there a form that says, what do you think about this, that and the other? Can we, can we have a look at that? So I believe, that, um, sorry, through the chair, I believe that we've, when the survey was, just, sorry, when the um, presentation was distributed prior to this meeting, there was a link within it to the to the survey form. Oh, but we sorry, do have, we, yeah, we do have, we do have copies here if you'd like to see. Yeah, I'd love to see. I'd yeah. love to see. That yeah. would be really good. Thank you. So and there's been a lot of thought that's gone into the design of the survey, and it's kind of broken down um, into three parts. The first part is really for. Uh, anyone to answer and and the aim of that front section um, is about understanding what the most important features of a transport service are yeah. so that's understanding you know is it about your proximity to a stop is it about the times that it comes is it about the fact that it's free yeah. it's about understanding for the, from the community stakeholders what are the top three things that um, they they value about the service so for instance one of the ticks boxes is like that, that, it, that it supports residents to get around, that it supports students to get around, that it supports people that need support getting around, you know, that it reduces carbon emissions, those kind of things. Yeah. It's, it canvases alternative options for um, a city transport service. So, for instance, would people be willing to use an on-demand bus service, um, Uber vouchers? And it asks the question around who do they think funds it and who do they think should fund a city public transport service. The next part of the survey is really about tar is targeted to understanding what user, current users think about the service, so why they use it, how often they use it, how satisfied are they with the service, and what improvements um, would they suggest to the service. And that that asks things such as, you know, is there one location in the city that you wish that the bus service went to? Then the final part of the survey is for non-users, and that's really about understanding why don't you use the service and what their ideas or any other feedback might be for the service. Right. Um, and why are we asking people about alternatives to the bus instead of why they prefer the bus? I'm, I'm just puzzled about that. Because you're, we're not expecting the bus to continue, or this is, these are replacement options for the bus? Is that why we're asking that? Uh, through the chair, uh, the consultation is to understand the service, um, and the service is to, well, the question is to sort of glean information around is a bus an option or the only option? Uh, is point to point service uh, probably more preferred? Uh, is it a price point? Uh, is it zero cost? So we're trying to understand the, the reason for the service and where the, where the community wish to go with the service before we actually determine the transport mode. And, and is, is that also because we're trying to determine whether we want to charge people for the service? 
that is the questioning of a thrust point. Uh, through the chair, the charge isn't part of the consideration at the point in time, it's about understanding what the community needs. Okay. And look, just one other question, and I know all the forms have already been done, um, but can we accept uh, written submissions? Uh, you know, one of the problems um, for many electors uh, who use this service is that they don't have access um, to computers or internet, and even if they did, a lot of them tell me that they have trouble um, using our Your Say website, uh, and therefore for them, their natural method of communication is right. Can, can we accept that? Through the chair. Yes, so an important part of determining the engagement approach is balancing, I guess, the need to get quality data that can help you make decisions alongside with equity in terms of people being able to participate. So yes. what we've proposed is that um, they're one of the ways in which people can provide feedback is to request a hard copy feedback form and um, they can contact Hugh, who's, I can't think of his last name, I'm sorry. That's all right. Yeah, yeah, so people can request a hard copy feedback form. And how will they know to, uh, to ask for one? So if they go to, so this information will be at council centres. It will also um, be on the website. So we're trying to cover both bases there by having it in the centres. So how to participate. Yeah, yeah, in terms of how to participate, there's the um, feedback information, the background information form. Yeah. And um, on the last page there, it says, how do I provide my feedback? So there's an online survey, yep. the community online workshops, which ideally is much better if you can do them in person. And this is one of the hardest parts of engaging under COVID is that we have to go to this online world. Um, the stakeholder workshop, but also hard copy feedback forms. That's so right. there, the community centres and libraries will have access to the file that they can print out on demand for people to be able to Complete Thank you. And will we note that on the court flicks as well? That is for people who use the service to know that they can submit a hard copy. That's on the court flicks. Uh, it's not at the moment, but we can we can look at that. Could you? That that would be really good because yeah. that was that will assist uh, uh, people who are not able or yep. don't want to use computers. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. That's great. Thanks. I'm so pleased you're enjoying this workshop and you voted against it, Councillor, but I'm glad you're extracting the value. That's oh, really, this really is a good. really important matter. It is. Yes. It is. I'm and so glad you've been able to give your feedback. Voters as well. Uh, we'll go to Councillor Knoll and Councillor Sims and Councillor Mackey. Chair, I just need to say that I need to go. So. Thank you. Did, was there, there any burning yeah. things you wanted to say? Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. No, just a short comment, and that is uh, I do appreciate the. Uh, you know the format of which you're you're putting this out, and also the, to the great detail that you're going, because let's face it, no matter what happens uh, uh, after December, we'll at least have be armed with the ability to make the best determination on behalf of our ratepayers. And I think overall, uh, you're doing a good job like that, and I look forward to seeing what the outcome is. Thank you, Councillor Simpson. Thanks, um, Chair. Just having had the opportunity to uh, look and um, give some more direct feedback. Um, question three, which of the following best describes your household? Um, that may maybe should be rephrased given um, some of the people that use the service may not have a fixed address, so that might, might be something to consider. Um, and when um, it talks about um, the alternative options for travel in the city, it may be clearer for the user if none of these also gives the option of retention of the current service so that people can you know actively express that desire um, just a question for the um, initiator of um, this review uh, new councillor Hyde um, just to be clear on the outcomes that you're seeking from the review so is your view that um, one of the outcomes could be that the uh, service is scaled back as a result of the review that you've initiated. Is that your intention? The intention um, uh, to answer your question, Councillor Sims, you can probably go back to my address um, and pull it out as well. But the intention um, uh, is to actually get more people using the service. And if anything, that might mean a slightly expanded service. So for example, if we found out that um, uh, if we actually sent it a bit further or sent it to this location or that location, you might pick up uh, uh, quite a substantial number of extra users. 
um, and in doing so, without touching your uh, financial contribution, um, you actually increase the efficiency and you bring the cost per trip down. So instead of seven, if you, you're sending, spending the same money, potentially, uh, or it, come, it might come to promotion. How you okay. No, you've answered the question. So you're spending the same money, yeah, but but you're, you're getting more people on, and thus you're making it more effective, more efficient. Sure. Um, the point was raised, I think, by Councillor Martin about the um, cost um, and whether or not we'll be looking at that as part of the uh, survey. I would hope not, because there was a resolution of this council where we agreed that we would maintain it as a free um, service. So that matter, in my mind, has already been settled. I think that wouldn't be part of the. Well, I, and I think they said they're not. Yeah. They're not considering that as part of that at all. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Mackie, then Lord Mayor. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, just a very quick observation uh, in relation to your, your your commentary just then, Chair, which I absolutely agree. The function of tra trans transaction cost per passenger is a function of the, the extent of utilisation and so I'm comforted by your the, the openness to the idea of options that might in fact actually increase utilisation and therefore by default that mathemat reduce the actual mathematical calculation uh, which is um, a big question. Uh, in relation to the proposed engagement activities, thank you. Um, very, very much. I, I think it's terrific. Under promotion and social media, um, it, it occurs to me that there, there's probably potential for council to kind of leverage its relationships with some very, very significant uh, cultural slash event presenters who to help get the word even further out because. Um, Realistically, not everybody hangs off um, council social uh, media, but I'm thinking Fringe by Adelaide, even Superloop. These are significant events that bring hundreds of thousands of people into the city, and for whom we, you know, if we can encourage them to return and make mobility easier, uh, their, their their perspective, uh, being at least being invited into a conversation, might help expand that. Uh, um, uh, the, the efficacy of the exercise. Through the chair, what we can do is when we when we um, contact each of those stakeholder organisations, we will invite them to the workshop. Um, we will encourage their membership to complete the survey. And while we're doing that, Council, we can ask them to share on social media as well. That's yeah. that's it's that nice bit of yeah. leveraging yeah. those social media networks. Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, one of the things that uh, I've spoken about before is um, I'm aware that there are other services that are out there than not just the connectors. So the university has a service, um, some of the aged care facilities have service, we have a shopping service that goes to Central Market. Um, so I'm not sure if this is the right place in terms of our engagement, but um, what, what I was very keen to see is how the overlay of other free services, so for instance, um, if we have the perception that we think that it's actually bringing the university students, but they've got their own shuttle going. Um, so how we look at the overlay of what other free services or services are available through the area would be. So it might be a question in here in terms of if there are other services they also use or currently use. Um, just as a suggestion to see if there's, so, so we can actually understand if they're using this on those days and this at other times. Through the chair, we can include that as a question in the survey and potentially list, list what some of the options, what, what the other services are that are known in the city. Thanks. Yeah, I had a similar comment to the Lord Mayor, um, but more from the perspective of how that information would be considered within the process for coming up with options for council. So the engagement process sounds great. Then, given what we already know from the city access strategy, whenever that comes in, the engagement process, all of the existing services that are around, 
will those things all be considered? I know some of the early feedback that came from people who were um, concerned about the proposal that initially came out with the reduced loop that considered existing public transport was that one of the benefits is not having to get on and off multiple forms of transport and that being one of the barriers to people utilising public transport free services. So how this fits into the whole process to then end up with options for council and the point about the Lord Mayor, existing services, whether, you know, in the evenings when the city of Ad when the University of Adelaide have got all their free shuttles, you know, is there anything there that we fit into or all of those other, how does the rest of the picture fit in with the engagement to give us the processes at the end or the options at the end? Through, through the chair, the, uh, the approach of the consultation is to fact find. Um, the approach then after that is to gather all that information, put it together and then undertake some optioneering uh, to then bring back to the chamber, considering all those different elements and overlays to bring back to the chamber for a decision. Members, any further contributions? No, um, uh, and forgive me, I haven't gone through these um, uh, questions, like Councillor Martin and said the link. Um, just carrying on from Helen's point though, is there a question in here asking people whether they catch public transport into the city and then use the connector? Like how do they get to and from the city in the first place? Just be, she mentioned hopping, hopping on and off and that sort of thing, how people get in. And... You speak to that bit, please. Sorry, through the chair. Apparently, we uh, do have some current information about how people get to the city, um, but we can certainly add it as another question just to confirm that as part of this. Yeah, I, I don't want to make things more piece, but I just think it would be interesting. Sure. Okay, any further calls? No? Fantastic. That was an excellent workshop. Thank you very much, Matthew, and thank you very much, Zoe, and everyone for your enthusiastic participation um, in it. We will now go to 4.4, uh, the workshop on grants guidelines. Uh, and we welcome Christy. Hello members, I have with me Lisa Loveday, who's the Manager of uh, City Wellbeing, just to assist tonight. Um, so this workshop is to give you the opportunity to uh, provide input into the Grants Guidelines Review. Uh, we've provided you with a lot of information that we um, will assume is read. And at our meeting um, on the 9th of June, we agreed to look at the guidelines for the major grants categories, and in particular, those organisations receiving funding for one to three years, you recall. You also agreed at that meeting to provide the organisations uh, that we had approved with one year's funding, uh, and to come back to you to review the grants guidelines. So just as a bit of an update, since then, we have um, reviewed the grants guidelines uh, in relation to arts and culture and sport and rec, and rec against the strategic plan for 2020-2024 and we're refreshing the cultural strategy as you know to bring back to the chamber which will also dovetail into the current guidelines um, and it's rather synchronistic that uh, at the same time KPMG also conducted an audit on the event funding to look at the grant and the grants processes were wound up in that which provided some very specific improvement suggestions and I'd just like to uh, let you know what we are already progressing in relation to the um, So we're working at the moment with uh, internally with IAM um, and procurement to process a single digital system which will feed into all of the grant processes. So that is a, a portal, much like all other many other councils and, and arts uh, government grant systems. And this will ensure a consistent information is provided to all customers and to us internally. So that's well, well underway and we're very excited about that. Uh, we've also streamlined the process by realigning one of the staff members in my team of community and culture to work across all three grants. Uh, and that is in process at the moment and that will also add a level of um, consistency across it all. 
And with this system, we will also be able to seek third party peer assessors to join the process and look at the grants externally through the portal and, and uh, provide assessment for them. So that will give us much greater uh, expertise and transparency around our decision making. Um, a further review of the guidelines will be undertaken based on your feedback tonight and what you'd like to, to see. So we, um, we won't go through the whole presentation given to you. Really, we'll just, uh, um, I guess, open a conversation knowing that grants have enabled us to engage deeply with our community and um, support them to support themselves rather than doing to them, doing with them. So I thought if we might start with discussing the sport and uh, recreation and sport grants program guidelines and priorities to see if there's anything you would like to include. Can I have a second, Chair? Yeah. Look, it's not a suggestion um, around what should be included, but just a question, I guess, around the the. Um, revisiting the decision to uh, reduce the grants from being uh, what were in effect three year um, grants to one year um, and no, sorry Kathleen, whether, they weren't three year grants they were they were grants well, well, each they were, year they were grants that years. would be going to be um, but we actually can't we actually could only do it one at a time well, that, that was going to be done for a three year approved year. separately so i'm just wondering how what kind of communication strategy was adopted in terms of engaging with those organisations and you had any feedback on whether they've, the impact that that's, that decision has had? Because I can imagine for a few of the organisations, if they had planned to think that they were going to have the funding for three years and then they've been told you've only got it for one and you might have it, um, you know, you may or may not get it for years two and three, has that impacted on things like people being able to employ staff and if you had any of that sort of feedback? Through the chair, at this stage, they are anticipating the outcome of, of our grants workshop and any changes that may may need that they need to reapply. But we haven't had any direct feedback that suggests their programs can't continue. They're all anticipating and hopeful that um, we will be able to progress with with the, a, a longer term commitment. But if we were to if we were to just have a one year commitment, then in effect it would mean it would be the end of some of the programs and potentially some of the staff working on those within those organisations. Is that right? Through the chair, assuming that they were under the impression that they would like to receive for three years. Of course, it came to the chamber and it was up to you to decide that. So they haven't made any long term commitments. I, I guess we've only provided them one year commitment funding. Thanks. Uh, back to the subject matter before us, recreation, sports, grants. Any suggestions? Yes. Councillor Martin. Uh, look, I, I actually have had feedback from an organisation uh, in the sport rec field, um, which was expecting uh, a three-year uh, agreement and which is now struggling with a, uh, the prospect of a one-year agreement. And it does mean that uh, it is possible that staff may not be retained. But the point that was made to me is that um, it, it makes uh, the organisation less efficient and therefore deals with the funding it receives less efficiently because it's not able to make plans for consecutive years. Therefore, everything and every process is a brand new process every year rather than a commitment to three years. Um, and, and they were quite mystified as to why the council didn't understand that. So look, uh, I endorse entirely, uh, I think where council assumes that uh, we're actually imposing inefficiencies on organisations and ensuring in some cases that the money isn't spent as well as it could be. Um, I would like to see uh, that uh, retained if possible. I accept that um, uh, it is the team's view it shouldn't, but I do believe it's the wrong decision. See, there you go again, councillor, putting words in everyone else's mouth and ask you not to do that. What's that? To suggest that you, you are speaking for people other than yourself in this chamber. I, I said I, the, the, the team made the decision. No, 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 you tried to represent other councillors' views. I just ask that you don't do that. I don't, I don't All you have to do is say yes, then we can move on. I, well, I'm puzzled by what you're saying. I can't say yes to something. What, what are you saying? We'll move on. Well, that's a good 
Councillor Pike. Thanks, Chair. Well, to a certain degree, I actually agree with Councillor Sims as well as Councillor Martin. I do see that some of the organisations who have good reputation that, like, I mean, we should approve, uh, we should give them the approval, have uh, three years funding, hence they can have better planning for, I mean, on one hand is the staffing and uh, staff, and on the other hand is better planning for future events, whatsoever. I just like to ask, like, I mean, though, I mean, when you do the scoring or when you do the assessment, would you actually have some guidelines in place, say, like, for me say, on one hand, how many years the organization has established, and on the other, and second, how many years they have already run the event? Because I remember last time when we, when we make a decision to, I mean, kind of like did not approve the funding for three years, but instead just I mean, give it for one year. On one hand, it's because of the COVID, and uh, we, we don't know why. Uh, I mean, what will be our future financial position is. On the other hand, at the time, there were some organizations who are newly established and they have never, they don't have any checkable records that they can, they can. I mean, like, I mean, use up, uh, use our farm wisely or in the right way. So I just I, I'm just saying that whether or not like during your assessment that some of the some of this information could be considered by how many years the organization has established and how many years they have already run the same event continuously with with good with good reputation and good checkable records. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, to be honest, we haven't, we don't actually ask how long that organisation has been in existence, but we do ask for uh, good financial information uh, that enables us to ensure that they have the capacity to to deliver. But it does not necessarily discriminate against a new organisation coming in. So we we would look at a new organisation alongside um, long-term existing organisations. Yeah, the, the reason why I ask that is because like quite because I've been involved in many different community groups and especially for some of the new community groups that they don't have the experience to on one hand manage their financial budgets, on the other hand is to host those make some of those major events which cost a lot of money. And that that's the reason why I should raise it up. Uh, Councillor Mackie. <coughs> thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the administration for the, the work that's gone into this. Um, like um, uh, Councillor Ho, who spoke before me, I, I recognise in some categories of, of project program service delivery, um, there is merit in uh, triennial uh, commitments and the, the same principle applies at a state and at a national level um, across whole program, um, whole categories of, of um, within programs. Um, I know that you're asking us to reflect on the sport and rec program, but just to save duplication, I'm just, just I know these are, are, are overall observations. Um, I'm really pleased to see uh, a commitment for the, uh, the higher dollar value categories uh, program to move to a peer, um, uh, external peer assessment. Mm -hmm. I think it pro provides uh, officers of council uh, uh, a, a better arm's length and therefore through, through the administration, the elected members, uh, another layer of, of, of rigour uh, and it's a benchmark standard practice that's, a, that's adopted. I absolutely accept that in other jurisdictions within South Australia and local government, that's not necessarily the practice, but we're a capital city and we're probably, even though I would love, um, I would imagine some others would love to see our, our resourcing of these programs expand in future years. Um, uh, we, we nevertheless do probably spend um, more than many other jurisdictions. Um, so this is a good piece of work and um, I appreciate the effort. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you. Um, uh, I agree with Councillor Mackey in terms of the peer assessment. I think that's a great way to go. I'm just, I'm just looking at, in terms of sport and rec, in terms of the categories, um, I mean, obviously the facilities grow, so one-offs, um, and then 
the majority of the approved ones are multi-year funding. So once the multi-year funding has <laughs> been allocated, what, who does that exclude in the following years? Because if we're doing multi-year, then obviously we're pre-committing our budget for the following year and the following year. Um, I mean, there's, there's obviously not a lot of take up in terms of quick response grants. And so I'm, I'm just really curious as to the difference between, um, these are all programs, so uh, the events which are generally one-off or uh, multi-year program funding and where that leaves us in the second and third year. Thank you, uh, through the chair. Uh, you'll actually notice that actually most of the sport and rec grants actually are granted for one year uh, on the basis that uh, they're coming to us with a significant event of some description. It's really the community uh, development grants and perhaps, perhaps for the brevity of uh, time, I could just jump to the questions and we could mix up the discussion around the specific programs if you prefer to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, did, were you going to speak to the other slides well, after that? Or no, did you want to, they are, you want there to? are three categories here and I think that if we go into great detail on each one, um, yes. I think everyone's chafing up a bit to talk about <laughs> everything. So, uh, yes. If that's all right, we can talk about any and any one you like. Yes, Councillor. And look, um, my mistake, but I was talking uh, generically about three year funding. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, I was just because Lord Mayor, were you done? Did you finish? Uh, or yes, was I there... wasn't quite sure where you were going to go with that. I'm not sure if I got answered. So we can Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't have closure on that one. Sorry. sorry, through the chair, let me close. Uh, sport and rec grants. You're right. There is a single pool of money. Money, and if, if uh, for three years it's all allocated in one year, then that would uh, be reoccurring. That's not the case, as you'll see. We offer one year uh, grants as well, and we ensure that there is some capacity each year to ensure that there's money returning. And of course, um, the the budget is determined annually, so it's never a given each year. Yeah. And the other thing that I had to do a little bit this year when we did the budget is. The, the, the ones that are we're looking to approve for funding, whether that be one or three, comes in. But the ones that have already been approved, that are in triennial funding, we don't see. So it's actually um, part of the reporting is that we lose track and some of them have been funded in the last council. So we don't actually, we, we've lost track that they've been funded because they don't come back in in any reporting sense. So it's just, I'm just curious because then I'm sort of looking at the well hang on, if we've all if we've allocated all of that, how do we continue to allocate? Through the chair, if I could just uh, provide a quick comment. Um, so in previous years, what we've done at, at budget time in sort of February, March, April is giving you a full list of all um, recipients funding and then giving you the allocation that's left within that bucket for each of our 12, 15 grant programs. So um, we'll make sure we pick that up, particularly during the budget cycle, so that there's visibility and transparency. Thank you. I was just going to say I was talking generically as well across all categories in terms of uh, triennial uh, funding. Uh, and um, additionally, um, I, I did want to address indexation across all of those areas. And, and I I do think that um, uh, we have the capacity to properly index. Um, we are, from the benchmarking information that's been provided to us tonight, uh, spending uh, less in some categories than other cities. In fact, we're among the cities that are benchmarked the lowest spending. Hobart spends more than we do. Um, but speaking generically, uh, you know, I, I just um, a feel for people like the festival uh, who we held a civic reception for in January who were actually pleading with us to reverse our decision to not give them an indexed amount year on year for the three year uh, funding agreement. It is the same amount year on year and the point that they make is the amount is reduced by the impact of inflation uh, each year and they nominated those things that they're going without. And similarly with the fringe, they too have pleaded for indexation. And it's somewhat ironic that the council, um, which is regarded as uh, uh, 
a, a council which treasures its festivals and its arts, um, that we are not looking after them to the extent we could. Uh, and I do ask that the administration uh, look at how we can provide that proper indexation for each funding period. Thank you. That's it. I think that was just feedback. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, our sponsorship program, which yeah. obviously has um, different objectives, different outcomes. Sure, I am, I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking generically general. across all of them. Okay, members? Great. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, <clears throat> just a, a, a quick little. Uh, uh, very quick uh, history uh, uh, lesson back in 2006, I think. I'm looking to you, Lord Mayor. Um, the Adelaide Fringe uh, uh, went from being biannual to annual, and um, this council, I'm not impugning any individual member of administration or, or elected members, the resolution of that council uh, at that time was in effect to punish the organisation for going annual by halving the annual amount of funding that was provided. Uh, and then likewise in 2000, when the Adelaide Festival of Arts, uh, sorry, uh, in 2010, 2012, when the Adelaide Festival of Arts went from biennial to annual, its council support halved each year. Um, How's that punishing? I don't know. <laughs> just the same amount, you just get it. Well, well, did it yeah, twice, sorry. Twice, twice the yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Right. And, and those organisations have made history uh, in terms of cultural impact uh, and uh, contribution. Um, councils stake in it, and in the case of the Adelaide Festival, the, the right to a position on the board effectively diminished in relative terms. And that, in fact, is, I think, part of the contributes to the 997,000 uh, figure, which hasn't kept up with inflation and, and the same observation with regard to indexation. Anyway, it's just a... Uh, Sorry, just for clarity. I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, I'm simply sharing that as a, a piece of history for those elected members who uh, may not have been in, engaged in at that time. Yeah, just, just for clarity though, on the, were they being given less per annum? Um, yeah. So, so they, they changed to annual and they also halved what they, they were giving them? They, so like they, if once they, doubled, once just they doubled their delivery. In fact, I guess the, the evidence shows more than their outcomes uh, on half the support from the city. Uh, so, but so was it half the amount that they otherwise would have? Yeah. 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 So, so each year, I, I'm, I'm going to. I may be wrong here, but so the Adelaide Festival of Arts used to receive from Adelaide City Council five or six hundred thousand dollars per festival. Council Randy might have a. a it was per festival, festival and which then, was biannual, but, and but, it was half. Oh, so, sorry, of course, the festivals. Yeah, festivals like three hundred. Okay, sorry. Sorry, but that's actually not what these are. These are these are the yeah, that's so, sponsorship. So our funding for sponsorships on top. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I just needed to resolve that uh, incongruity yeah. in my mind. Yes, Councillor Sims. Just a, a, a very um, brief uh, comment into a final observation. Um, I have no criticism of what administration um, have done. I think this looks good. Um, and I agree with the um, comments that have been made around peer assessment and so on. I do think a principle that would be worth establishing, though, is that we don't um, conduct reviews in of a, um, a funding cycle. So if an organisation has applied for three-year um, funding and they've lodged an application on that basis, I think it is poor practice for us as a council to then suddenly pull the rug out from under them halfway through. So I think going forward, we should make a commitment that if we're going to have these reviews, that's fine, but we don't do it in the middle of a funding round when people have already lodged an application. I, I don't think that's a fair thing to do, particularly in the middle of a recession. There you go. Some further points? No, I might just I might just pick up pick up um, Christy on the, uh, the summary of the KPMG audit. So am I, am I correct in reading that um, 
to mean that the arts and culture and sports and recreation grants uh, were not found to have uh, performance improvement opportunities by our internal auditor? That's correct. Okay, all right, all right. So, so the CDGs um, uh, do need to be looked at. Could you just delve into a bit of a bit of uh, a bit of uh, a bit of detail around around what improvement opportunities are there as far as this that that program goes? Through the chair, I think particularly because uh, there had been the intention to look at some of the ANZP Adelaide Zero Club, um, Dame Roma Casey recommendations and that hadn't been undertaken in full was why that was pulled up through the KPMG audit. So there is still a, um, an intention to ensure that some of those, some of that funding fits at the specific purpose. It's, of it's properly case. into the into yeah. Adelaide Zero Project. So it's about aligning, yeah. aligning to outcomes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Um, and that's, and that's uh, if I may just make a quick comment, uh, that, that was definitely um, the basis upon which I wanted to bring this in. I thought in particular the community development grants um, uh, needed to be looked at to assume the property actually. No, no, no. That's I, I think I said that's why I supported bringing it back oh, in. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and because I think I think there are I think I think there are as as identified uh, improvements to be made as far as making sure that aligns um, to our goals. One of the things I'm uh, that that concerns me looking down the list. Um, and having uh, been in and worked in government for some time now. Um, with the grant programs, you get organisations that are very good at writing grants um, and uh, uh, dealing with the, the, the bureaucratic process and, and all the ins and outs. And there are organisations here that have done it you know, year on year. They've been successful um, uh, often. And you see everywhere from industry and innovation grants to community grants, you will get bigger players who come along very professional, very polished, um, and they'll be successful in get, getting grants because they put together a better application. Um, uh, and it's purely based on, uh, based on, I mean, look, you can only assess what's in front of you, but it's actually, it's actually because they've put in a better application. What really, really concerns, and what concerns me is that they really crowd out of the market um, other people that may have, that may have a worthy idea, who perhaps haven't been able to pursue and realise that idea. Um, and perhaps if they had the opportunity, I mean, a grant is sort of like a, a break for an organisation um, uh, to help them uh, grow and develop something or a program that they're doing or an initiative. Um, if they're crowded out of the market by people that are already doing it very well and doing it uh, successfully, um, then they'll never get that break. And that's what that's what really concerns me with it. It's sort of it's the usual suspects, and, and some of those organisations are you know they they hold quite a substantial balance sheet. And they hold quite a substantial um, amount of donations that come into them um, and go out of them. Uh, but that, that I think, is something that really needs to be brought to the fore and represented um, in how you administer and look at the CDGs and what 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 your guidelines are around around ongoing programs. And, and the other the other the other question is, you know, um, and it sort of touches a bit on what the Lord Mayor was saying around ongoing stuff and also other councils sort of conflating the sponsorship issue and the things we sponsor year on year as opposed to a, to a one-off grant. All for us to, if we think that there's an organisation that's doing good work year on year and it's something that we believe is within the purview of, of the City of Adelaide 2 fund, um, then perhaps we actually should think about sort of formalising outside of the grants process, something like that. Um, uh, but to use the grant itself, um, which is which is really meant to go to a wide array of organisations uh, to merely fund the same program year on year is I think is a little bit of a corruption of the intent of what a grant is supposed to be. Uh, yeah, please. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, perhaps one of the um, opportunities could be to set aside a certain quantum within the CDG program um, and we've done this um, previously for um, other activities that could be able to enable other new entrants into the market um, and perhaps set a smaller quantum aside allow these groups to pilot or test their program in a sort of safer way with a less less 
risk profile around ratepayer money, um, and then you know that could be the, the way to manage uh, those types of concerns. Yeah, I think I think that's an excellent way. I suppose if I could, if I could, if I could sum up my you know, words in, in two things, it comes to need, um, and and I guess it also comes to, to innovation and and supporting different ones at points in time. So uh, I'm not suggesting means testing it or something, but uh, you know. It, are we meant to be funding large organisations that do the same thing year on year, or are we meant to be using it to look at new um, ways of addressing historic problems, you know, that sort of thing. Anyway, uh, I appreciate you for taking that feedback on board. Are there any other points? No? Okay. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Lisa. That was a very good presentation and very constructive workshop. Thanks, you. <laughs> You're very welcome, Councillor. Any any time, any time. Uh, and last, but by no means least, four five, uh, the workshop on permit fee model review. Uh, welcome, uh, Vanessa and and Mel. Welcome, Mel. We haven't seen you in a little while, have we, Vanessa? No, I don't think you have. Welcome so, back. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Um, Everyone else is as well, truly. I know. And I know this might seem might seem like a dry topic to be finishing the evening <laughs> on. <laughs> um, but actually, this is this is actually an exciting piece of work, and it's something that um, has been a vision I know of Claire's for a number of years that we would get to the point where we may actually have just one fee in our um, fee schedule to make it easier for our customers to navigate and also to make it easier for us to administer and I think we may well be very close to that. So um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, there was a lot of um, background information, including lots of links to all sorts of different um, pieces of background information. Thanks to Mel for pulling all of that together. Um, so I did just want to say, we acknowledge it seems like an odd time to be talking about fees and charges um, and we also acknowledge that council has already talked about the 1920 fees and charges and we and you for the most part frozen those at the 1920 rates so this is not intended to um, divert that decision at all um, but it is a piece of work that we have been working on for, for well a couple of years really if you start back to the work on the permit policy um, and how how our customers can use our public space and so we really felt that as though it was actually important that we brought this in because um, a revised fee model does provide the opportunity for us to really streamline things for our customers and make it a lot simpler and in some cases cheaper for um, our customers to do business in the city so we're not proposing that um, we would make any changes to fees until 1 July next year um, but it is something that if council has the appetite to move forward with, we can do all of the preparation and um, start working on embedding that into everything. Yeah. Um, so the key milestones were in um, the, the paper, but just to sort of recap, we did we did start a permit review project a couple of years ago. Um, We've been, we, we also did, there was a KPMG audit of our permit framework which helped guide some of the projects we've done um, to date. We've made a whole lot of digital service enhancements. Um, we conducted a workshop with committee last year and, um, and council also recently endorsed the temporary use of public space policy which has been really helpful so we've been able to integrate a number of policies into one. Um, and I guess what we're seeking feedback from um, members tonight is on the proposed fee model principles, which we took from um, the workshop with you last year, and they align really closely with our temporary use of public space policy as well. Um, and that's been repeated there. Um, and also the rationale behind the proposed fee model, which you would have read in the papers, is actually about setting a rate um, for the use of public space and um, if, you, if you delved into any of the links and the background information you would 
remember that we, the way we currently charge fees for permits for the use of public space is very varied um, and not very consistent. Sometimes it's on activity, sometimes it's per day, sometimes it's based on space. And we think that this is a much more equitable um, way of charging for the use of public space. It's consistent with how we charge events for the use of space in the parklands. It's consistent with our um, parklands leasing and licensing. Um, and, and it's also a way in which customers can really, um, they can manage how much they pay by how much space they use and how long they use it for. So it's much easier for them to um, change their own fees. Um, so really, it's just over to members with the key questions. So I'll hand back to you, Jeff. Councillor Martin and Councillor Sims. Yeah, look, Chair, I, I need to leave. I just want to say that um, I think this is a, an excellent concept and also entirely. I think it would be great if the administration agreed that we have a relook at it at the end of one year to make sure that it's functioning properly. Um, the second thing is, I think that in some respects, things like outdoor dining, which it's proposed will remain free, need to be still recorded on the rate notice, even if it says we waive that. Because one of the problems associated with such free services is that people forget. Therefore, we should remind people this is a charge and uh, this is being waived. And my only argument is that we are waiving fees for buskers. And while some of them are very good, it is my view that many buskers ought to be paying the city of Adelaide for <laughs> performing in Rundle Mall. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Robert? Thanks, Chair. Um, I also am supportive of this, I think. Um, sorry, 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 sorry. We'll just, we'll just wait. You're being interrupted, Robert. Thank you, Chair. Um, see you, Phil. Um, Thank you. Uh, I am also um, supportive of this. I think this is a really um, good piece of, of work that's been done, so thank you. Um, I guess that the only question I had is whether it will have an impact on council's revenue um, and where, or whether it's likely to be cost neutral or so I'm, I'm interested to know that. Um, I totally agree with Phil's suggestion around having the um, the waiver for the outdoor dining fee stipulated on the notice. I think that's a good idea in terms of reminding people that there is a value for use of the public space, but the council has decided to waive that. Um, in terms of these buskers, no, I think we should continue to uh, provide that as a free um, opportunity, recognising that having people busking in the public space creates a vibrancy and gives people an opportunity to you know, showcase their, their talents. Um, so yes, I wouldn't uh, support um, charging fees for, for that, but I think the general principle um, makes sense. Um, through the Chair, just to respond to the question about revenue, um, I guess the short answer is it's really hard to tell um, because um, so unlike uh, the events fees, but by way of an example, um, activities on the street year on year differ. Um, so it was a bit easier to predict that with the event fee model because we had events that had longevity and multi-use and used similar amount of space so we could predict it. Um, what we have done with the modelling though is um, really endeavour to a whole lot of permits that have been issued um, previously um, and try to work out whether customers would end up paying more or less if they were to apply for exactly the same um, And I think on balance, um, there are some unders and overs. And so, you know, my best estimate would be if everybody did exactly the same thing that they did this year, then the revenue would be relatively the same. Okay, great. Thank you. Councillor Nolan. So I suppose to the first question, obviously being consistent is certainly a, a, a very you know intelligent thing to do, and certainly from what I saw, <laughs> certainly not representative of any of the uh, of the opportunities, etc. Particularly some of the small business type things where just you charge so much. 
and you'll never know until you've done it how um, how much more people will take up the opportunity to do that. And I was thinking, you know, that nice, uh, uh, um, you know, distinction between a clothing business possibly doing something on the street, which makes a big difference, by the way, uh, versus the, the dining, then certainly there is a lot of extra opportunity and also a character and city vibrance that I think we could get out of that. So I think there's a lot of opportunities by you know, enabling others to, to use the street as, as part of their, their offer. I mean, continuing on with the uh, the dining, et cetera, with no fees, et cetera, then yes, I mean, I think for the next couple of years, we're not going to get too many choices around that simply because of the, the, the situation with the virus. Um, and, you know, that's we've got enough opportunity before the end of the term to, to have a bit of a think about that if there is something that people want to do different. Um, and, uh, well, I suppose the, the, well, I suppose it doesn't matter too much. Uh, it would be it, it will be interesting if we have are able to benchmark what we're doing, what's happening now. I mean, COVID is certainly not a great example, but maybe we go back a year and say, here's what we uh, we got as income across these these things, because you want to know is it winning? Is it wasn't worth my while? Am I all excited and it was for nothing? Um, or is it is it uh, actually now enabling other businesses? And again, your ability to say, hey. Uh, if we do this or this or uh, change it somewhat again and refine it, you might be able to get a lot more activity uh, out of it and you can actually measure that and come back to us. It's there, is it? I looked at I looked at the individual ones. Which page? Um, through the chair. So in the in the workshop paper, um, mine says slide 14, but of course it won't have been slide 14 in the agenda. Um, we have some re a permit revenue summary from 2017 to 2020. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, page 53, page 53, slide 53, sorry. Yeah. So that might, is that, that might be what you were Yeah, because yeah, I went to all the, 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 the links, links. etc. Yeah. So, anyway, but yes, overall, I, I you know, quite support the concept. Jesse. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm not suggesting that this is not the case, um, but I think it's worth reiterating um, my um, perspective that uh, um, a key guiding rationale should be the should be um, the elimination of uh, economic distortion uh, wherever possible. So uh, I know that's a difficult thing to, to quantify, but I do think that should be a uh, a key uh, goal uh, with any of these these measures. Um, I support the continuation of busking and outdoor dining as no fee activities um, but you may want to consider um, for example uh, waiving outdoor in fact we've waived outdoor dining fees um, there are those businesses in hospitality who cannot provide outdoor dining um, and uh, it may be that uh, some allowance for uh, works that are done uh, it, it may be that some uh, sorry, was that over something? Sorry, I was pricking my nose. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 To give some the heebie jeebies. It's a power sorry. move. Sorry. I think it's called a power move. Oh, uh, <laughs> <how> interesting. <laughs> um, no, um, I, I was just saying. So, okay, outdoor dining fees. Um, you look really perplexed. Can I make, not make the sense? Or I'm not making sense? No, I'm not. No, no. Oh, right, okay, sorry. Um, okay, outdoor dining fees. Outdoor dining fees are waived. Um, obviously, there's all these businesses that effectively is a subsidy from businesses who cannot provide outdoor dining, dining to, to those who can uh, from one lens. Um, that's not to say we should not support outdoor dining fees. I, I you know, strongly believe they should be um, waived and continue, uh, especially after COVID. But you may want to consider the fact there's an economic distortion then. One way to counter that is to consider if uh, bricks and mortar, in, in internal based restaurants or whatever, uh, are going to undergo some construction uh, and then in lieu of their not paying outdoor, you know, not having outdoor dining fees being waived, there's some, there's some consideration on the fee structure that's charged consequently, if you, if you see what I mean. Um, so, as a, as a, so that's what I mean by an example of looking at, at at, 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 at economic distortions and trying to, I think, trying to iron out economic distortions wherever possible is, is a really good basic principle to, to uh, consider. Thank you, Jesse. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I think this is excellent. It's a really excellent reform piece and, um, and has uh, been on the bucket list for a long time for some people. So it's great to see. Um, can I, just a few questions. We are still issuing permits to buskers, correct? 
Yes, and we're still issuing permits for outdoor dome. Yes. So what, what is the approximate administrative cost, just ballpark, of, of the issue of the permit? Because I, I also think that these should be cost neutral where possible. So um, I know that we waived half a million dollars in outdoor dining fees, and I'm not suggesting that we bring the whole half a million dollars back, but if there's a cost in issuing the permit, $10, $20, $50 for an annual, an annual permit, then I'd be quite opening open to seeing an annual permit for for that for that outdoor dining or whatever. And it might the buskers are this 1600, 1700. Um, they do come back quite regularly. That maybe there's an annual permit that's five dollars or something, so that you are. I'm not quite sure of the um, the operations in terms of whether it's site specific or time specific or whatever, but. Um, yeah, through the chair. So I'll answer the busking question first because that's probably yeah. easier. So we've um, we're moving to self service permit for buskers that will all be online. So um, that's really exciting development. Yeah, so exciting. and we're at these permits where we believe that our customers will be able to um, do sort of self assessments. Um, that's our vision. So low admin costs. Although obviously we have to we have systems and things like that to administer to, in order to make that happen. Outdoor dining, I we did do that work um, a couple of years ago. I don't have the figure off the top of my head, but if, if council were, had the appetite to do this, we could, um, we do have applet administration fees in our fees and charges schedule that are separate to um, the use of the public space, which is what this fee would be addressing. So we could apply an administrative fee to the issuing of permits to cover the cost of the fact that we have a team of people to administer them. I guess I'm, you know, going back to the comment from Councillor Martin, um, they have forgotten that we waived all the outdoor dining fees. Like it seems to have just, you know, we, for the first year it was a really big impact, and then after that. Um, people forget that they ever paid it, quite frankly. And so it's one of those where um, it would be great if it's issued and it said, you know, that would have cost you $7,000 and we're waiving that $7,000, um, which which was a lot of the big hotels, particularly where they had their outdoor dining, they're the sorts of fees they were paying. Um, and they're quite significant in terms of what we've already foregone income, what we've already supplied to our businesses in the city. I think it's really good to remember that we've done that in some way. Anyway. Sounds threatening. No, it's just that, you know, in particularly in this environment where, you know, we've done such a raft of things that, that have um, helped all our businesses and all the households and residents, which is, you know, freezing the rate and the dollar and freezing, mm. freezing the fees and permit charges and, um, you know, uh, not doing debt collection and all of, all of the incentives and everything. But you know, call for more because people are hurting and it doesn't... Um, doesn't hurt to remind them that that we're already saved them a whole lot of money in this area or this area by yeah, foregone yeah, yeah. revenue. Absolutely. So, um, and it is a discussion in terms of our contribution in, is also in foregone revenue. It always is. Yeah. So, I just think it's worthwhile having that there. It's not it's not foreboding. It's not threatening. Foregone revenue is not taking money from someone else. But yes, no, I appreciate it. That's no, a, no, that's no, a no, nuanced no, philosophical no, argument we can have no, later. No, Councillor no. Noel. Um, okay. Just in regards to how you would how you would uh, um, uh, compensate for the expenses that you have, and I don't, I'm not sure because I haven't had to deal with it from council. But uh, um, you know, when we do inspections and it's food, uh, food safety inspections and things like that, uh, uh, is is that a separate area that you go to a business and say uh, for your outdoor dining? We, we actually, uh, uh, you know, there's a cost in doing that. So in other words, you're relating that cost to the activity um, rather than necessarily, I don't know if it is, I mean, I'm, I'm showing ignorance here. Um, through the chair, actually, we reformed how we um, charge fees in the environmental health space. So we only charge fees for inspections for non-compliant businesses because they cost us more to inspect. So that, and it's designed to be an incentive 
businesses to be compliant. Um, so, but in, in saying that, there is, you know, with a, with a permit like an outdoor dining permit, um, we do have to monitor people's compliance against those. So we do have um, people who do that as part of their role. Um, and it is one of the few permits we don't charge um, an administration fee for. Um, and so it is something we could reasonably introduce. I think it's $60 or $80 like that and and actually we've had a massive increase in outdoor dining applications this year which is a really positive sign i think it's up to about 700 this year so it's not you know charging a minor administrative fee would be um, could potentially cover the cost of administering them Simon, did you have your hand? No. no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I really wholeheartedly support the the uh, mentions of uh, waived uh, rates and waived costs. Um, I think it cuts both ways. Um, it's not just a reminder of benefit, but it actually is also an accountability mechanism for the council. Uh, it means that we are accountable for economic distortions that, that we introduce as a result of policy. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a really good and proper thing to do just in that kind of holistic distortion way. Thanks, Jason. Members? I might just make a quick point. Oh, sorry, really sorry, really I don't really always do this. this. Yeah. I always do this. <laughs> um, uh, regarding, uh, if, I can just, if I can just answer uh, that, that key question around outdoor dining fees, I do believe that they should remain um, as no fee. Um, activities, especially now when we're encouraging people, we're paying for them to put in outdoor dining, for goodness sake. So um, I think they should remain no um, fee. But but also, I, I take the Lord Mayor's point about an administrative fee or recouping some costs there, whether it should be all costs related to the administration or, you know, the part thereof or something like that. I think that's a very um, uh, fair point to make. Uh, regarding the economic distortion that Councillor Kira was talking about, um, I think uh, I think I think the draft of permit framework is very good, um, and you could take everything in business activation and all have it as no fee, potentially. So uh, I think that could remove and address some of that economic distortion. Um, uh, noting that, of course, it's still guided by all the relevant operating guidelines and. Um, and what have you, I and mean, just because something's no fee doesn't mean you're, you're obliged to grant it, so. Um, through you, the Chair. Um, I think the beauty of this framework is, you, is if Council endorse it, it sets a base fee, and in any given year, it's totally up to Council to decide what fees they may wish to waive. Um, and so that's the opportunity for Council to incentivise activity or, um, so that's, yeah, I would suggest you could do that when we bring in the fees and charges. Okay. That's it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. That brings us to five, which is closure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone.